Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I'll read that last verse one more time. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Have you ever felt really, really, really hungry? I know you have felt hungry, but I've been, you know, but have you, like real, real, real hunger, like I'm feeling right now? <laughs> Because I haven't had breakfast and I haven't had lunch. Uh, like Rejo was praying, we are in the middle of a move. Actually, last night is what when we moved. So I didn't even have my sermon. I was looking at my sermon notes all in the morning. and I couldn't find out, you know, because it's all, you know, it's messy right now in the new place. And uh, on my way, Emma texted my sermon. She found it. <laughs> she texted it back. So because of that, you have a sermon. Uh, but other than that, I, I haven't had anything to eat, so I, I really am hungry. If I have a remote control for all these things, you know, I would fast forward the whole ser service and go straight to the fellowship room right now, especially today's uh, mission Sunday. I hope something is cooking there. But anyway, uh, you know what I mean, because Jesus was talking about a kind of hunger, a kind of food here. That's why I was just kind of uh, bringing you to that point, right? Jesus said, the will of God is like food. It's a good metaphor he used. Because we understand the craving for food, especially because it is one of the primal instincts we have. When I was here doing the VBS class, I was talking about some primal fears we have, primal fears of human being. But one of the primal instincts of human being is Hungry, we, we want food, right? So Jesus said, my, my food, my primal craving is to do the will of God and accomplish his work. Now, I did a sermon on knowing the will of God last time. It must be somewhere up in the YouTube. Uh, I have had many people coming to me and say, Pastor, I want to know the will of God. Can you do a sermon on the will of God? You have no idea how many people have asked me to do that. But none of them, including me, have never ever felt so craved to know the will of God. Very often we think about the will of God is when we get married <laughs> or when we buy a new house. Right, that's when we have taken the decisions, but we want to make sure that that's right. That's when we want to know the will of God. But Jesus said, there is no way you can know the will of God like that. To know the will of God, you have to have a sense of primal craving that you will be willing to skip everything, fast forward everything, so that you can just do the will of God. Unless and until, don't even go and ask what the will of God is, right? Now, that's what Jesus said. Will of God is like food, like being hungry. Now, you know, I said, many people ask me to do, you know, to do sermons on how to know the will of God. You know, one thing people have never asked me to do a sermon on, you know, nobody has ever asked me, Pastor Matthew, can you do a sermon on the title, Doing the Will of God, as opposed to Knowing the Will of God, right? Doing the Will of God. Because let's be very honest. It is not that we don't know the will of God in many things, right? Let's be candid here. How do you know you are hungry? So Jesus used the metaphor. Let's stick to the metaphor. How do you know when you're hungry? When your pastor tells you on a Sunday morning, by the way, you guys are hungry, that's when you know it? You know when you're hungry when you read a book? You know when you're hungry when you, re when you listen to a prophet? You just know it. <laughs> There is no equation. 
There is no formula. There is no book. There is no strategy for you to know when you are hungry. When you are hungry, you just know it. That's the way we are wired. So is the will of God. It's the metaphor Jesus used. The will of God is instinctual, especially when you walk with the Holy Spirit. That primal instinct, like the craving for food, the craving for the will of God will automatically be induced in you by the Holy Spirit. If it has not been induced, we have to better go back to the basic and check because something is wrong. If you are really waiting for your pastor to speak about, to you about the will of God, or if you are waiting for a book to come about to know the will of God, then you are in trouble, spiritually speaking. That's somebody who knows about hunger. Isabel, right? <laughs> we both are the two hungry people in the room, I know. <laughs> By the way, they have freedom to interrupt my sermon anytime. They are VIP, so just... <laughs> so... Let's talk a little bit about doing the will of God, right? We were talking about knowing the will of God, but let's talk a little bit about doing the will of God because without doing, without the, you know, when, when the body tells us that we are hungry, we better give it food. That's why the body tells you. It is not just giving you some kind of signal. It is signal that signal has to create or culminate in an action. Otherwise, you know, it, it can have serious medical consequences, right? Like if you don't eat when we are hungry, right? So the will of God has to go with the, the knowing of the will of God has to go with doing of the will of God. I'll say that one more time. Knowing of the will of God has to go with the doing of the will of God. I'll, I'll read you an interesting scripture. Uh, it's almost hilarious. Uh, when I read it, um, you know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, here the Israelites go to Moses, and this is what Israelites say to uh, him, okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. They are saying to their pastor, who is Moses, hey pastor, you speak to us. Don't let God speak. We don't want to speak to God. We don't want to, we don't want to have any direct dealing with this God. We want to know what you are thinking of us. We want to know that what, we want to know what you want us to do. Let us do that because we don't want to know the will of God. We want to know the will of Moses. You know why? They are not stupid. They are smart. Because the next verse says, or we will die. <laughs> because see, knowing the will of God is not like, say, you, you just ask me, hey, Pastor Matthew, what do you really like? What do you want, want us to do? And I say, okay, I'm glad you asked. Then I say, I think this is what we should do. Then, they say, then you say, oh, great, great, great. Thank you, by the way. And then you go about your job, you know. And... That can happen because I'm your pastor. That's all I can do. I can only ask you. I can only, I can only tell you what my will is. I cannot force you to do my will. But when God asks you to say, or when you go to God and say, God, by the way, what is your will for me? And God says, I want you to do this. And this, uh, then you cannot say, oh, God, that's great to hear. Very nice. See you later. You can say that because you will die. You will die. See, that's why there is an inevitable vagueness whenever God speaks in the Bible. Sometimes, haven't we wondered when we read the Bible, can God speak a little more clearly? Right? Yeah. <laughs> through the cloud, you know, through some kind of sound and through some kind of prophet, some kind of metaphor and... Why can't God come and tell me, Matthew, I want you to eat this food or go to this place and live in this place and do this course? Why can't he do that? I always used to wonder. You know why? Because if he tells you that, if you don't do that, you will die. You will die. That's why. That's why he didn't want it to be clear. He, that's why when God came to this earth in Jesus Christ, 
Who was Jesus? First and foremost, he was a storyteller. Whenever people ask them serious questions, Jesus, Jesus tells them, let me tell you a story. Then we, I used to think that Jesus was telling stories so that it will make it simple. No, no, you know, right? Matthew chapter 13, go home and read. It says, Jesus told in parable because he didn't want those who are not supposed to understand, don't understand. Jesus told in parable to complicate things. That's exactly how it is written in, in cha uh, Matthew chapter 13. Because when he tells you a story, the decision is left to us. Because God tells you something, at that, at that very moment, your free will is eradicated. Does that make sense? Is it too theological? See, if I ask you to do something, you still have free will. Because free will is one of the greatest gifts God has given us, right? When I ask you to do something, you, you know, you can or choose not to do it. But when God asks you to do something, it is like you, you run a red light, you know, all the time. People do that all, all the time, you know, uh, in, uh, in L.A. But if there is a cop right behind you, because, you know, we, I mean, I have done, run red light by mistake, you know, not intentionally. But if there is a cop, then you, ha you have no free will. You, have, you cannot make that Because that yellow light is the light of decision making. Because you can go either way. Right? But if there is a cop behind you, there is only one way you're going to go. There is no way you can speed up and you better stop right there. The point I'm trying to make is the moment God speaks to us directly, they, we won't have any free will. Does that make sense? You have no free will because God told you what his will is. You better do it or you die. There is nothing else. There is no free will. That's why God speaks to you in vague terms. God spoke to you, Jesus spoke to you in stories. Because the resolution of a story, the moral of a story is something deduced by the listener. Because we don't understand the end of the story. Jesus, you know, complicated theological argument. Jesus tells a story and uh, bye bye. He didn't expose it. He exposed it only to his elect, only to his disciples because they have surrendered their free will to him. Only to them he explained the stories. Did you get that? That's why there is an inevitable vagueness whenever God speaks because the will of knowing the will of God always goes in hand in hand with doing the will of God. See, th this is the catch 22, I would say, you know. It's like a chicken egg kind of a question. What comes first? Because the more you know the will of God, the more you have to do the will of God. The more you do the will of God, and only when you do the will of God, you will know the will of God. I have a mentor from India who visited us, you know, for the last two, three days, and somebody who really uh, blessed my life and, you know, who is instrumental in being here. His name is Pastor Babu Chari, and some of you know him, some of you don't. And uh, he was telling me an analogy, something which I could easily resonate with. Or resonate with, you know. When I remember, there was uh, some time uh, ago, my car battery, you know, just like because I put the headlight on and I left somewhere, and battery, battery is gone, so I couldn't switch on the car. So thankfully, I had AAA. I called them. The guy came, and then he jump started the car with the battery, right? And uh, so he said, oh, he said there is just enough uh, charge for the the battery. So, you know, so, you know, start driving and it'll be okay. But then I remember at that time, of course, I know the technology, but I was so nervous because I thought, man, I just have enough charge. So I wanted to save it. But you cannot save the charge because the more you drive, then only it will get charged. Because I've seen with some people who, want, who refuse to drive because I only have a little charge. You know, I don't want to drive it because what if, what if something happens when I drive because I want to go home, so I'm going to save this charge. No, we cannot save the charge because we have to drive more. You have to use the charge to save the charge. Did you? Does that make sense? The more you drive, the more it will get charged. We cannot not use it, the charge which God has given us. See, that's why the will of God is something gradually, gradually unfolds. Two disciples, the first two disciples had to follow Jesus. And they came after Jesus and Jesus said to them one thing, come and see. 
come and see. That's all there is. I wish Jesus gave them a GPS or at least a map to see where they are going. Right? Jesus said, come and see. You will never know where you are going to, where you are going to go unless and until you take that first step. Come. Without a GPS. That's why the, the, the will of God is gradually unfolding. It's almost like, you know, you are climbing a staircase with a little candle in your hand. It's all dark. And there's a staircase. You can even, you can touch and feel it, but you are afraid of climbing it. And God gives you a candle and say, climb it. And you light the candle. You can only see one step. But you know there are more steps. I can't see any of it, but I can see one step. I'm afraid. I don't want to climb this. But when you put, the, put your foot on the first step, then the candle comes with you. Then you'll see the second step. Then you see the third step. The more you do, the more you know. The more you know, the more you should do. The reason we don't know the will of God is that we refuse to do whatever is revealed to us already, whatever is known to us already. That's why my, my encouragement to you is act on whatever little we know. Whatever little know. There are so many things we know already. There are so many things we know that we shouldn't do, but we are doing it anyway because so, much, so many different reasons. And there are so many things we know we should do, but we are not doing because, again, it could be work, it could be this, it could be our kids, and there are so many other reasons we can come up. But let's take a decision to do something God has already spoken to you and act upon it. Take that first step, then you will see the second step. The more you will know the will of God and the, by doing the will of God. You know, sometimes God will ask you to do something strange. See, that's where the test comes. And I still remember, I met this gentleman. His name is Dennis. I've told you about him, and I'll just re refresh your memory in a bit. I was, I was invited to speak in a conference, and I went there. This is in Canada. There was this white guy who came to me, and he looked, uh, he, he looked at me suspiciously for a little bit. And then he had a can of water in his hands, and I'm like, is he weird? So he's looking at me with a can of water. Then he suddenly rushed towards me. This is like a Jesus moment. He said, Jesus asked me to wash your feet. And I'm like, what? So Jesus asked him to wash my feet. Okay, I'm going to let him do that. He washed my feet. And I thought it was very, very silly. And I became best friends with Dennis after that. And I have learned from Dennis much more things I haven't learned from seminary. It is the same Dennis. Go back to one of my old sermons. Do you remember I told you about a homeless man who gave me a $2,500 check? Yeah? yeah? yeah. That is the same Dennis I'm talking about. That's how I first met him. This homeless man, he was a homeless man. He was a weird guy. Only weird people will do the, these kind of things. But he was so weird, he could listen to the subtle thing. God will ask you to do something silly like that. That's why Dennis could walk in the will of God. That's why he did the silly thing. And because of that, he, 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 he's, he's walking in a completely different realm. realm. And that, I, I could feel it, you know. And that's why even a homeless person giving me a $2,500 check, and it, you know, no disrespect to anybody, any of you here, nobody here has given me a check for $2,500. Even if you give me check, you know, even if you give me, and I'm not going to buy it, not for that, because you are not weird. You are normal people. Only weird people can do this kind of stuff. Only weird people will be talked into doing this kind of stuff. And they are in a completely different dimension when they are walking close to God because they do the silly things God asked them to do. And I learned that by walking with, or let's go to the Bible. God does not, uh, God not only asks us to do silly things, sometimes he asks us to do very, very serious things, like kill your own child. Like he asked Abraham, right? You know that story. Yeah, 
Kill my son? Sure. Why not? He's not even asking a question. He goes and he sacrifices, that's what the Bible says, you know, he sacrifices his own child without asking a question. Now that is the kind of people who will know the will of God because they will do the will of God. It doesn't matter without any question. Who can do that kind of stuff? See, that's why when Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed, God says, God sends people, God actually goes to Abraham and lets him know, this is my, well, you know, Abraham didn't, you know, why should he care? Because God couldn't hold it in his, because that's why Abraham is called God's friend. That's what friends do, right? Friends want to share things. If I have a true friend, I cannot hold certain things, you know, I wanted to share with my friend because that's, you know, it gets a, you know, my, friends pro my friend probably doesn't care about it, but I want to share it because it's, it excites me. That's what's happening in that episode. Abraham was okay. I mean, he was, he was going on his life. Hey, hey, Abraham, let me tell you, I'm going to do something else here. Because... He would do such a serious thing without even raising a question. And that is exactly how you know the will of God, by doing the will of God, whether it is silly or whether it is serious. So I believe that God has already asked you to do something. It could be silly. It could be serious. And I know you all have it. You all have it in the deepest, in the darkest corners of your heart. You're buried it. Because you're afraid that you don't want to make a mistake, right? That's what happens to me too. But I'm telling you, in a loving relationship, you can make mistake. Who knows my will more than anybody else in the world? Tell me her name. Joanne, right? <laughs> How does she know my will? Because did she take a course? Did she take a class on that? No, she lived with me for 21 years. So knowing the will of God is not easy. You cannot just do, give me a 20 minute sermon so that I can know the will of God. There is no way that's going to happen. To know the will of God, you had to live with, the, live with God and you had to walk with God for years and years. It is not something, like I said, like in a remote control. You cannot fast forward yourself to the center of the will of God. It takes time, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but there is no shortcut. You have to live together to know the other person's will of God. But when you are in that kind of relationship, it's okay to do something silly and stupid or even, I don't want to say it, wrong. If you are doing it from the intimacy of relationship, I still remember when Joanne got her CPA license, I wanted to surprise her with a gift because you always give gift during you know, um, birthdays and stuff. So I, I went, I took, I, I, I put a, a week of research into it and I finally got, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I, I just bought this nice stuff and I went to her and she looked at me and she smiled and she appreciated that gift and then in five minutes she said, where is the receipt? I want to return it. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> she did, she returned it. You know, I could have taken personally because, man, like, you know, I just wanted to please her. But she was pleased. That gift did its job. That gift did its job. She still talks about that particular gift I gave her, even though she didn't really want it. The thought behind it, you know that, right? The thought behind it mattered. So it is okay to make a mistake in pleasing or doing the will of God. You may not be doing the exact right thing you're doing. That's okay. Because that's allowed in a loving relationship that is long lasting. So in that catch 22, right? To know the will of God, you have to do the will of God. But then for you to do the will of God, you have to know the will of God too, right? See, that's why I said it's a catch 22. You have to step in at the circle at any given moment and you will have to learn sometime by making mistakes. And I'm giving you my mistakes so that you can go and make new mistakes. You don't have to make the mistakes I made. That's why we listen to sermons and that's why I listen to other people's stories because it is, uh, it is, it is something that evolves in, in our relationship. See, God won't tell you his will unless he is so confident that you will obey it. Otherwise, it is for your own detriment. You will die. He knows. See, I won't tell my will to my neighbor's kids. I will only say that to Hannah or Emma because there is a relationship there. 
And I know they are going to be obedient to that. I know they are going to, they are going to walk according to that. Only my, so, so the will of God, knowing the will of God or even doing it, is a matter of relationship. Once you are in the center of the relationship, don't think twice about that, that instinctual thing that is coming to your mind, like Dennis. You know, God asked him to go and wash this strange Indian guy's feet. But from that emerged a great friendship. And that's somebody I really miss, Dennis, this homeless man. But I've learned, like I said, I've learned from him more than from a seminary or many pastors. That, that's what, sometimes God asks you to do something silly, you know, yeah, you make a mistake, yeah. But, but, but God will forgive you and God will be pleased. God will have the same smile Joanne had in her face because he knows that you, you did that from your absolute obedience to him and your absolute love to please him, right? Now, just to wrap up my thoughts, you know, Jesus also said the, the verse, the key verse which we read, uh, read says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, okay? Now, this, this is, it sounds very similar, but it's very different. He said, my food, you know, why, why I'm here for, is to do the will of the one who sent me, that is one thing, will of him. And the second is to accomplish his purpose or accomplish his mission. Jesus said, see, there is a bigger picture to all this small, small thing. So the will of God is to accomplish the mission of God. This is Mission Sunday, so it's appropriate for us to speak about this. I'll say that one more time. The will of God is to accomplish the mission of God. See, what is the, when, when we ask the will of God again, you know, we always go to the minute things. We ask, which woman I have to marry? That's what we want to know. Which college I should go? That's what we want to know. Which job we have to take? That's what we want to know. I know these are important. God knows it is important too. But we have to always remember that. We have to see this in the bigger context of the mission of God. What is God doing here on earth? He is here to send you to college? He is here to, say, to, to get you married to the most beautiful woman out there? No, that is all part of this puzzle. You are only one part of the bigger puzzle God is going to do, God is doing here. The mission of God, we call in theological language, the missio dei, the mission of God to build the kingdom on earth, the kingdom of God on earth. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. He didn't ask us to, uh, to pray, oh, when all this is done and I'm somehow suffering now when I'm dying, I want to come to your kingdom, Lord. No, he said, thy kingdom come because he is already on a mission to establish the kingdom of God. For that to happen, we should all be transformed into the image of his son. We should all be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is his will. All other things are supplementary to that. What is the will of God for you? Very easy. I can give you answer right now to transform you into the image of his son. For that purpose, he might ask you to do a job you don't necessarily like. He might ask you to live in a place you don't necessarily want to live. You know, that's the way it works because only then you will be transformed into the image of his son. And I don't want to do here on a Sunday afternoon. I would rather sit in a couch which we don't have. <laughs> or watch a TV which we have in Connected. <laughs> That's what I want to do right now. But I'm here because God wants me to be, you know, it's, I'm not here to preach. And I'm here to educate. I want to be transformed into the image of his son. I want to walk with him. I want to obey, obey him. I, wa I, I want to listen to the subtle voice that is speaking to me all the time so that I want to keep doing it. Because if I stop doing it, then God will stop talking to me. I know that very clearly. So, the mission of God, always remember that we are only a small puzzle, you know, you know puzzle pieces, right? The big picture, in which there are small, small little pieces. We are all little, small, small pieces. Always remember when you pray for, whether it's for a marriage, whether it's for a college, whether it's for a house, always remember that this is only part of the puzzle. God is out here to do the bigger things, and he has called you to be part of this bigger thing he is doing. So be happy about it. So be privileged. Feel privileged about that. 
right? So the will of God has to be connected to the mission of God. One last thing. When I say this, you know, yeah, doing the will of God, and, you know, I always make, sometimes people feel guilty about it because, man, like, you know, I don't know how to do it. You know, I'm a weak person. There are people who are strong-willed. Have you seen that kind of Christian? They are so strong. They get up at 5.30 in the morning. They read the scripture, and they, they you know, they fast, and they pray, and, you know, they, 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 they're disciplined. And they, they, there are people with willpower, right? Right, right? Like, you know, you, you need to have willpower to do certain things. The people who have become successful in this world, whether it's corporate or any field you take, they have strong willpower. And I look at them, I feel jealous because I don't have that kind of a willpower to follow through something. You know, set your mind on it. Do it, Matthew. Do it. Let's go. You know, it's like a training like SEAL Team 6, right? Like, you know, do this. But this is the irony of it. In Christian life, doing the will of God is not by willpower, but by exact opposite, which is surrendering your will. Now, this is two different things. The world's will, the will of the world is done by willpower, building the willpower. The willpower. That's how we do that, by strong discipline. If we are doing, if we are trying to do our Christian life that way, we will end up like the so-called legalist Christians. You know what I'm talking about, right? Legalist Christians, they are all, everything is all about them doing. It's all about work, work, work. And that's what happened to the Sadducees and Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were good people. They were good religious people. But for them, religion was all about willpower, all about doing things. But Jesus said, doing the will of God is easy. Piece of cake. Surrender your free will. Not to build it up. Surrender your, your will. Now, interestingly enough, surrendering your will is much more difficult than building your willpower. <laughs> because surrendering your will means you have to let go of your ego. Let go of your control. How can we lose control in our life? And that's exactly what Jesus is asking us. Can you surrender your will? Can you offer yourself as a living sacrifice in the altar? Because only then the Spirit of God will manifest in you. And the scripture uh, says, uh, you know, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 13, it says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Shall I read that again? Listen to it carefully. It's almost insulting. It's almost insulting when I read that scripture. This is what I say. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. If, 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 if the scripture said, it is God who is with you to work towards his kingdom or to work towards his pleasure, I understand that. But it says, it is God who is, in, who is at work in you, in you, both to will. So even the will itself has to come from God. So I don't have any control on this. I cannot look back and say, oh, I am Pastor Matthew John. I wanted to do this. I wanted to be a child of God. I wanted to be transformed in the image of, uh, of his son. I wanted to do the will of God so that I can help with the mission of God. No, 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 no. Even that very will belongs to the God who is at work in you, both to will and to work. See, that's why surrender Self-surrender is so important in knowing the will of God and eventually in doing the will of God.